This week on the Green Left News podcast, Australia cancels Palestinian visas mid-flight, protecting native forests and the campaign to free Russian anti-war socialist Boris Kagalitsky. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis. I'm excited to talk about all the latest news from the past week. And we'll kick it off, as usual, with the Palestine protests over the past weekend. March 16, 17 was the 23rd continuous weekend of mobilizations against Australia's complicity in Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza. The protests took place as the holy month of Ramadan is underway. And while Israeli starvation policies and direct slaughter of Palestinian civilians lining up to collect food and aid continue. or Melbourne, thousands of protesters marched for Palestine on March 17 with a sit-in near the State Library before being told to move on by the Victorian police. Speakers on the platform included six-year-old Palestinian Nader and prominent Australian comedian Nazim Hussain. Thousands rallied in Gadigal or Sydney the same day and Green Left reporter Peter Boyle said there was something special about the march. He said perhaps it was because it was the first big march during Ramadan or perhaps it was the unimaginably horrific situation facing the people of Gaza. He said the speeches pierced to the heart and as we marched down Pitt Street Mall, thousands of marchers chanted in unison, cease by now. He said they then held a sit down on the street, the chant becoming louder and louder. He looked around and tears were running down people's faces, those of many onlookers as well. A few days earlier on March 14, protesters rallied outside the Egyptian consulate in Gadigal, calling on the Egyptian government to let food and aid into Gaza. Meanwhile, the 24-hour vigil at Anthony Albanese's electorate office in Marrickville has continued for more than five weeks now. And on March 14, protesters staged a die-in outside the office as part of a national day of action. Another one of these die-ins took place in Mullabimba on Newcastle and another in Lake Macquarie, as well as many other sites across the country, with protesters conducting a silent procession holding bloodied and shrouded bodies to the horrific sounds of massacre in Gaza, before lying down on the ground in a symbolic show of solidarity. The Mianjin Brisbane rally on March 17 was combined with an iftar dinner, the breaking of the fast during Ramadan, and speakers addressed the starvation of Palestinians in Gaza by Israel's siege and blockades. Students for Palestine organized an action disrupting the city and then joined the Iftar afterwards. Northern Rivers for Palestine staged a die-in outside the office of Labor MP for Richmond Justine Elliott at Tweed Heads on March 16. And activists then joined a rally at Burley Heads, which was organized by Gold Coast Palestine Solidarity. In Cairns on March 15, a vigil was held to draw attention to the genocide in Gaza, with Free Palestine Far North Queensland organizing participants to read details about the events of the previous fortnight, as well as personal stories about the effects of Israel's slaughter. Also in Nam, protesters gathered outside the Department of Home Affairs to condemn the Albanese government's decision to cancel visas of Palestinian refugees fleeing the genocide in Gaza. Protests also took place in Bathurst, Hume, Lismore, Central Coast, Bega and the Blue Mountains. Green Left's Facebook page has been censored and taken down by Meta for our support for Palestine Liberation Movement. Green Left has been targeted over our invitation of Palestinian liberation fighter Leila Khaled 
to the Eco Socialism 2024 conference in Borloo or Perth, which is happening on June 28 to 30. And now our posts about inviting Layla to the conference have been taken down, followed almost immediately by the Green Left Facebook page. An attempt to put up a new page was also taken down and it looks like we can't rely on these big social media companies to continue sharing our eco-socialist news and updates. If you would like to support Green Left against this censorship, please become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support to make sure you get all of our content sent straight to your inbox. And make sure to check out our website, greenleft.org.au, for the latest videos, podcasts, and analysis. Now let's continue with the podcast. Marybeth Council in Nam or Melbourne was one of the first, last November, to call for an end to Israel's genocide in Gaza. On March 13, the Council voted unanimously to support two more Palestine motions, which were initiated by Socialist Alliance Councillor Sue Bolton. The motions included continuing to fly the Palestinian flag until there is a permanent ceasefire and to stop doing business with companies benefiting and profiting from war and weapons. Bolton also won support for her motion to the National General Assembly of Local Governments, calling on Labour to advance peace in Gaza by ending weapons support to Israel, calling for a permanent ceasefire and for the siege of Gaza to be fully lifted. She also won $10,000 to go to organisations helping recent arrivals from Palestine to the Marybeck area. Uh, Shamefully, Labour councillors Lambros Dapinos and Alan-Olivia Kali Hanan and independent councillor Helen Davidson hoped to deny quorum to debate and vote on the motions and didn't attend the meeting. However, their cynical tactic backfired and a large crowd gathered outside the council meeting to support the motion as well as countless honks from passing cars. Protests have been held outside the Heat Treatment Australia factory in Nam every Monday and Friday to demand it stop supplying the Israeli military. As we've previously reported, HTA supplies parts for the F-35 fighter jets that are currently being used by Israel to bomb Gaza. The Australian Department of Defence says HTA is a vital to the Australian supply chain for the F-35 Joint Strike fighter. The protests at HTA follow a recent rooftop protest at Rosebank Engineering in Nam, which also supplies parts for the F-35s. Eight people were charged after protesters scaled the roof of the Bayswater site on February 19, and the Israeli Air Force confirmed in November that it was using F-35 combat jets to bomb Gaza and using them to drop 2,000-pound JDAM heavy munitions. Campaigners say Australian companies and the government that granted the export licences could be complicit in the genocide in Gaza. Green left's Suzanne James spoke to Green Senator uh, and Defence spokesperson David Shoebridge about this very issue, Australia's role in arming Israel. Shoebridge spoke about the increasingly prolific arms industry based in Australia and the lack of transparency and compliance around taxpayer-funded defence and munitions contracting. Seeing this unfold in front of our eyes and seeing our government, uh, I think, be actively complicit in it has been pretty hard. Um, uh, so so what, we, what we've endeavoured to do over the last five months is to get some straight answers from the government and get some information about the extent to which they are permitting Australia, Australian companies to, to arm Israel, um, the extent to which Australian, the Australian government is permitting the ongoing expert of weapons to Israel. Um, and of course, you know, the flip side of that is the extent to which we're also importing weapons from Israel, weapons that have been effectively experimented on the Palestinian people. So you can listen to that full interview in the podcast feed here or at greenleft.org.au. Now, Palestinians fleeing war-ravaged Gaza for safety in Australia were left stranded when the Labor government abruptly cancelled their visas. The subclass 600 temporary visas were approved between last November and February for Palestinians with close and immediate family connections in Australia. Families of those fleeing Gaza and organisations who are assisting began to receive news of visa cancellations on March 13. 
and the stories of those affected have been shared on social media, including the 23-year-old nephew of a Palestinian Australian who was stranded in the Istanbul airport for four nights after having his visa cancelled mid-transit unable to return to Gaza and unable to legally stay in Istanbul. Another story is a mother and her four young children who were turned around in Egypt when their visas were cancelled, meaning they were unable to board a flight to Australia. A family of six was separated with three children allowed to board flights, while their mother and the youngest child was left behind. The Department of Home Affairs said the government had issued around 2,200 temporary subclass 600 visas for Palestinians since October 2023. And these subclass 600 visas are temporary. They do not permit the person to work or uh, get education rights or access to Medicare. Um, And at the same time, Israelis have been granted 2,400 visitor visas during the same period. The Palestine Australia Relief and Action Group, or PARA, started an email campaign which generated more than 6,000 letters to government ministers within 72 hours. And the Refugee Action Collective, Victoria, uh, called a snap action on March 15, supported by Socialist Alliance and PARA. And in response to the pressure, some of those whose visas had been cancelled received news on March 18 that their visas had been reinstated. It's unclear how many Palestinians are still waiting for their visas to be approved. And after a public campaign by Palestine solidarity groups, including Families for Palestine and the Australia Palestine Mental Health Network, the Australian and New Zealand Mental Health Association has cancelled its invitation to an Israeli social worker, who's also an IDF soldier, to address its frontline mental health conference. One member of the Australian Palestine Mental Health Network said, Besides the immorality of hosting a member of a genocidal military force, it would be deeply intolerable for any Palestinian subjected to the intergenerational trauma inflicted by the State of Israel to be lectured about trauma by someone complicit in the current attempted genocide. Zionist groups, including the Zionist Federation of Australia and the Australian Jewish Association, said the cancellation was based on anti-Semitism. But an Australian-Palestine Mental Health Network spokesperson said the conflation of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is a way for Zionists to smear anyone speaking out against Israel's brutality and occupation of Gaza. This is evident in the huge outpouring of support and advocacy for a free Palestine that has been headed by many Jewish voices that are (laughs) anti-Zionist. About 3,000 people marched in Nipaluna or Hobart on March 17, calling for an end to native forest logging ahead of the March 23 Tasmanian election. Veteran climate activist Bob Brown said it was the largest pre-election protest he had seen in Tasmania. He said, our job is to get rid of the earth destroyers. The Liberals want to expand native forest logging in Tasmania, with Liberal leader Jeremy Rockcliffe saying he wants to unlock Tasmania's native forestry wood bank. Meanwhile, Labor wants to extend native forest logging contracts to 2040. The Greens want native forest logging ended and have a plan to protect forests, safeguard culturally important heritage sites, and provide alternative jobs for forestry workers. New South Wales Labor introduced a bill on March 13 to criminalise conversion practices which seek to suppress a person's sexual orientation and cause physical harm. If passed, the bill would outlaw practices, sustained efforts or treatments that are done with the intention of changing or suppressing the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. There would be a maximum penalty of five years for doing these practices. Now, gay conversion therapy practices include pressure from a church or religious figure to suppress someone's sexuality, including religious rituals such as exorcisms, as well as psychiatric or psychological treatments and aversion tactics. Also in New South Wales, community representatives from across the state gathered in front of the state parliament on March 12 to demand that New South Wales Labor not proceed with its bill, which essentially would make it harder for forcibly merged councils to de-amalgamate. The protest was organised by Demerge New South Wales Alliance, 
with Greens MLC Dr. Amanda Cohn and Independent MLA Dr. Joe McGear addressing the crowd, as well as Hilltops Councillor Brian Ingram, former Inner West Mayor Rochelle Porteous, Northern Beaches Councillor Miranda Causey and Canterbury Bankstown Councillor Barbara Curie. Residents had expected Labor's bill to be debated that day, but it was deferred. Shortly after, hundreds joined a Save Greater Sydney coalition rally outside New South Wales Parliament to call for real solutions to the housing crisis, not New South Wales Labor's pro-developer rezoning and development scheme. A range of speakers, including veteran campaigner Judy Mundy and mayors from across Sydney, criticised Labor's one-size-fits-all plan Monday's call for more affordable and public housing was well received. Zoe Baker, who's the mayor of North Sydney, said Labor had adopted an easy and divisive narrative, blaming councils for the failures of successive state governments to provide sufficient social housing stock. With the cost of housing to rent or buy at an historic high, she said affordable housing targets needed to be mandated alongside rezonings that have given private developers windfall profits without delivering new affordable housing. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. Family members and supporters of renowned Russian sociologist Boris Kagalitsky have initiated two fronts in their campaign to free the 65-year-old political prisoner. Together with lodging a cessation appeal with Russia's Supreme Court against his harsh five-year jail term, an international petition has been launched demanding his release, along with all other anti-war prisoners. Kagalitsky, who is the editor of the online leftist media platform Rabcor, or Worker Correspondent, was jailed and banned from administrating any website by two years, for two years upon release by a military court of appeal on February 13. Among the international signatories are national, state and local politicians, including Jeremy Corbyn, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Sue Bolton, Naomi Klein, Tariq Ali, Walden Bello, Kavita Krishnan, Yanis Varoufakis, Kohei Saito and many more, including Australian Greens MPs. You can sign the petition at freeboris.info and there's a link in the podcast description. In Argentina, hundreds of thousands of women, LGBTI plus community members and allies took to the streets of Buenos Aires on March 8, filling the streets of the capital and marching to the Plaza de Congreso. This is in response to far-right president Javier Millet, who's declared war on all sectors of Argentine society, including women. Deputies within Malay's Liberty Advances Coalition announced in February a bill to overturn legalized abortion, which was achieved in 2020. And following the general strike in January, the General Confederation of Labor, the Argentine Workers Central Union, and the Argentine Workers Central Union Autonomous joined the protest on March 8. The mobilization came just weeks after Malay's administration unilaterally announced on February 22. It was shutting down the National Institute Against Discrimination, Xenophobia and Racism, which was formed in 1995. Three years after the February 2021 coup in Myanmar, the Australian Labor government is facing renewed criticism for its failure to impose meaningful sanctions on the illegitimate military junta. Since the coup, 2.7 million people have been internally displaced, almost 79,000 civilian homes have been destroyed, and more than 20,000 civilians have been detained, while more than 4,500 people have been killed. While Australia's allies, the United States, the European Union, Britain and Canada, have imposed regular rounds of sanctions on the junta and its source of funds, Australia's lack of action has enabled them a reliable flow of income. Sanctions introduced by Labor last year have been criticised as more of an exercise in election box ticking than a real commitment. Unlike those other countries, Australia has not imposed sanctions on the cabinet members of the junta, and moreover, representatives of Myanmar's military junta have attended the special summit events between Australia and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations 
in Melbourne on March 4 to 6. All indications are that they will also attend the 35th ASEAN Australia Forum in Laos from March 16 to 17. Susanna Patton, who's the Southeast Asia Program Director at the Lowy Institute, said Australia's sanctions were the most basic possible measures. Papua New Guinea and Indonesia have formally ratified a defence agreement on February 29, a decade after its initial signing. The agreement enables an enhancement of military operations between the two countries. And according to PNG Foreign Minister Justin Kachenko, the joint border patrols and different types of defense cooperation between Indonesia and PNG will, of course, be part of the ever-growing security mechanism. But what does this mean for West Papuans who have been oppressed and hunted by Indonesian security forces? Currently, the situation in West Papua is deteriorating steadily. Thousands of Indonesian military personnel have been deployed to various regions in West Papua, especially in the areas affected by conflict. Indonesian military personnel captured two teenage students and fatally shot a Papuan civilian in the Ahukimo district on February 27, claiming that they were affiliated with the West Papua National Liberation Army. Now, this happened just before the ratification of the new border operation agreement between PNG and Indonesia shows that it's not just a simple security agreement to address border conflicts, but rather an issue of utmost importance for the people of Papua. You can read more about all of the stories we've talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate, and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music that you heard in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the podcast description. And remember to follow at Greenleft Online on social media for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.